industry anyway. Why is all of this important? Why are we doing this in the first place? Well, it enriches our understanding of how life, how genes, how the genome and the species evolve. We learn not only how sequences came to be, the way that they are today, but also we can predict how they will change in the future. So the thing here, that's why we're also doing this, is to classify the organism, aside from the naming of the clades. So you guys don't end up naming all of this organism or lumping all of this organism into reptiles. Because when you do that, you end up making a parapyletic group because your birds are not reptiles, right? So a, more, a much more better way would be to call them Crocodilomorpha, Skomata, the snakes and lizard, the turtles, your testodines, things like that. So we don't end up making the mistake of calling all of them reptiles. We can name them like this. Don't do this. Okay? So moving on. The important assumption in your phylogenetic trees is that first is there is what we call a change in characteristic that occurs within the lineages over time. We have the different characters. We have, well, we have two characters that we need to remember. We have what we call apomorphic and your pleshomorphic characters. When we say Pleshomorphy or pleshomorphic characters, these are the original or your ancestral conditions. Diba? As have been mentioned by Sir Dane, your pleshomorphy are usually a shared ancestral condition. For the case of your apomorphy, so that's pleshomorphy, for the case of your apomorphy, it is a change condition. So we have two, apomorphy and pleshomorphy. Apomorphy is the change condition. Pleshomorphy is the ancestral condition. We have two types of apomorphy. We have synapomorphy and otapomorphy. Synapomorphy is a shared change condition. Otapomorphy is a unique character for that lineage. While for pleshomorphy, there is only one. We call them simpleshomorphy, a shared ancestral condition. Is that okay? So there are changes that occur in the lineage over time. And there's also what we call a branching, no? a branching pattern of lineage splitting. We always take note of this because through this speciation event, like here, right here, right here, and here, and here, this branching, this lineage speciation event, organism come to be. No? That's the most interesting part here. What could have happened in this point in time, in this point in life, no? That made them branch out or split out from each other. This will also come to us, no? As humans. What were those events that led to the speciation of us as a species? That's the most interesting portion of this, actually. That's the important assumptions of your trees. You have a change in the characters of your lineage over time, and there is the speciation, a bifurcating event, a branching pattern of your lineage. That why, that's why you have different species that you are observing now. And also, any group of organism is related by descent or from a common ancestor. So that's the thing about the phylogenetic tree. That's why we call it the tree of life. We have this common root that led to the speciation of different domains and then eventually to us and we are just a speck in this tree we're just a leaf in this tree it's actually a profound and humbling experience to look at this tree of life we descended from that common ancestor and through a lot of things that happened through a lot of processes came us, a single terminal species. And now, we're studying how that, how the hell that happened, no? <laughs> it's the glory of studying systematics. You get to know the story. Because life is a, a continual chase for that narrative, 
a continual search for a story. And that's exactly how biosystematics will fit in. So how do we, well, how do we reconstruct trees? How do we create this different tree of life? I will put a link in the description if you want to see the updated tree of life, your position in that tree of life, and the different organism that there is, and how profoundly insignificant we are. But how do we create this tree, this tree of life anyway? Well, we usually use different characters, no? Or character traits in reconstructing these trees. So, for example, we use different characters like the presence of forelimb, amniotic egg, the presence of hair, the presence of your vertebra, your spine, and so on and so forth. So, aside from that, we can also use different sequences to reconstruct our trees. No? And that's the more advanced form, or I mean, updated form of reconstructing trees. We look at the genetic material that is in them. Because frankly, if you want to find something, or um, if you want to find an evidence for evolution, you don't need to look somewhere else. You don't need to uncover some very deep rock, very deep fossils. You just need to look at yourself. Look at your cell. Look what's inside your nucleus. Look at your DNA. Look at your chromosomes. Your DNA, your chromosomes are the exact evidence that you need to prove evolution. And what do we do with this data, these characters? Well, the first thing we do is measure them and then we compare them with each other. And then we use a tree that is based on these characters. No? We use these characters, these numerical characters, and we create a simplified tree based on parsimony. No? When we say parsimony, it's, it's kind of like your Occam's razor. This is the thing about most of scientific knowledge that we have. No? We use the principle of Occam's razor or your parsimony principle. In which, you know, when we say Occam's razor, the simplest explanation for a phenomena is probably the correct explanation or the right one. So that's the thing with parsimony principles. All of these characters that we have here, all of these characters, we create a tree of life from these characters. Uh -oh. So we create a tree of life. So imagine this is a tree. Anyway, so... You can imagine a much more uh, beautiful tree than what I'm drawing right <laughs> now. But yeah, you use all of these characters. You use those data, you use those DNA sequences to create some tree. And you, what we do is we create a different, a bunch of trees. No? And we choose the best fit tree for our model. We choose a tree that is the most simplest because if it is simple, it must be the correct answer. So that's parsimony. That's what we're using now in science. No? Because we, I know, I know a lot of you would doubt that. Me too, I, I doubt. I'm a doubter. <laughs> a doubter. I, I, I doubt these methods because it doesn't mean it is simple, it is the right one, diba? But for science, we, we like to enclose ourselves in this bubble, no? this bubble of a model-dependent reality. And in that bubble of your model-dependent reality, presence of the quarks and so on and so forth, people and scientists would like to have a much simple and a grand, simple and beautiful explanation that would explain these natural phenomena. The more simpler it is, the more correct it is. That's how science has been. And for the longest time, you know, case of gravity, case of forces, fundamental forces of the universe, it's been correct. No? I mean, it's been holding up up to this point. But yeah, <coughs> so say for example, we have this tree. You know? If we're using the parsimonious principle, the parsimony principle, if we're using Occam's razor, which of these three would be much better to use. 
So, well, for me, I would definitely go to this one. Because if you see here, we have a, well, a, a disjunct no? between the characters. You have two characters here that are essentially the same. But why is it in here and in here? Does that mean that's, that this character evolved later on in life than this character? So this character evolved independently? Then if you put it like here and you put the ray fin species right here as a branching off but containing the bony skeleton, it would much make sense, no? Rather than it evolving independently of the rest of the organism. So that's how important Occam's razor is in our sense. Do you see that? That's the thing about Occam's razor. It simplifies. And the more simpler the explanation, the better. So how to use these three? We can use them to also predict certain characters along the way. No? So aside from tracing the evolutionary history of life, of us, the evolution of humans, and so on and so forth, it can also create a certain map of which characters was lost along the way. No? So it can also make predictions on fossils. That's why there are a lot of fossil reconstructions. No? The bones that you see in your museums, for example, of your T-Rex. Have you ever been in a museum with, where there is a T-Rex? Those bones are not complete. During excavation, some of those bones are lost. But if the majority of the bones are there, Geologists and, well, science biologists can reconstruct the rest based on the other related organisms or the purpose of the form of the bones, no? things like that. You can create these predictions about the fossils and how certain characters are lost along the way. For the case of your ankle bones in your whales, you can create certain predictions like that. And also create certain predictions on the presence of important compounds. For example, your Taxol. No? This is the most you know, popular drug, anti-cancer drug right now, which can be extracted naturally from your Taxus plant, your Pacific U, Taxus brevifolia. So the uh, common name of the drug is, I think it's Paclitaxel, and it's an anti-cancer compound drug. And there are a lot of Taxus species in the Philippines. So if you find one, you could get rich from them. I don't know. <laughs> but that's the thing here, no? Since the Taxus species belong to a certain genus, a certain family, you could expect that the same Taxol compound could be present in other species, not just in your Taxus brevifolia, but other species of Taxus here in the Philippines. So you can search for them and, well, profit from them if you'd like to. No? Aside from that, we can learn about the order of evolution, how things evolve, like how certain species or family of your spider evolve different kinds of hunting abilities. Some are orb weavers, some are, some are burrow hunters, some are using traps, and some are ground hunting like your jumping spiders, things like that. Say, for example, how diverse the, especially for insect species, they are, well, in, in your, if we talk about your tropical parts of the world, especially in the, near the equator and further out for some long miles, the insect species are the most, no? especially for hotter climates. Insect species are the ones that, really thrive and really colonize, no? really successful in colonization. The only place where insect species ha are having a hard time is your Arctic regions, in your polar caps, no? where there is a colder climate. And there is a high diversity of these species, no? insect species. No? And for example, your beetle, you can learn about the diversity of the organism. No? how they branch out and they diversify based on the diet that they are having, how many species are there. It's like another explosion events kasi, if you look at this. When they transition to 
feeding on angiosperm, they explode, their species exploded than when they are feeding on non-angiosperm plants. Because there are a lot of species, a lot of niches to be occupied. Since there are a lot of angiosperm plants, your beetles can take advantage of that and have this speciation of different organisms, different food source. So with that being in mind, there are different characters that are out there that we can use for the construction of your phylogenetic tree. But which of those characters are the most important one? We need to think about the difference between your homologies and analogies. Homologous characters and analogous characters. Okay? So which characters are more important? The homologous character or the analogous character? What, what do you guys think? You have your final answer? Yes, the most important characters that you need to consider in constructing your phylogenetic trees are your homologous characters. Okay, so we have to find them. So these characters or this attribute or features that are, well, genetically and genetically determined and heritable and is usually relatively invariable within the operational taxonomic unit will let us denote, no, will enable us to denote a clear discontinuities from the other similar characters no, that is sometimes caused by convergent evolution. Because the, the thing with um, allogenetic tree or the tree making process, you have to deal with a lot of characters. And you have to bear in mind that there are analogous characters. When we say analogous characters, these are characters or attributes that are similar in function. Say for example, you have a butterfly's wing and a, you call this, you have a butterfly's wing and you have a bird's wing. Both of them have similar in function, but that does not necessarily mean that they have the same common ancestry. So your bat wings, your bird wing, it's not the same with your butterfly wings or your dragonfly wings. They have the same function, but they have different ancestry. Okay, ba yan? So they are only analogous characters. When we say homologous characters, these are characters that are similar in appearance and also similar in ancestry or origin. Say for example, yeah, the first example that we made, no? Your bat wing and your, <clears throat> sorry, your bat wing and your bird wing. They have a common ancestor, that's why they have the same number of bones, same similarity in features and appearance, and also they have the same function. So are so they are homologous character. Other homologous characters are there are a lot of homologous characters out there. There are morphological homologous characters. When we say morphology, the first one that we have mentioned, the bird wing and the bat wing. They have the term morphology, no? or the other limbs, no? the four limbs of different mammal species, of your different undulates, no? the, the zebra, your horses, they have the same four limb morphology. No? And there is also a <coughs> ontogenic homology. So the first one, morphological, that's easy to distinguish, just need to look at it, and if it's morphologically the same, that's morphological homology. It's in the anatomy of the organism. The second one is the ontogenic homology, or this is the similarity in the embryology or the development of organism. That's the thing with every mammal species, actually. There is this theory, we call it the theory of recapitulation, wherein it says that organism during their embryonic development, they tend to recapitulate or remember their evolutionary history. 
That's why we have the, the gill slits when we're young, no? when we're an embryo, we're a developing embryo. We have gill slits, pharyngeal slits, that, well, when you grow up, you lose them eventually. But they were there, the gill slits, when you're an embryo, a developing embryo. Also, we have the tailbone. No? Oh, oh, I mean, we have a tail, an autochord, during our development. We have a tail, we have an autochord, but eventually, we lose them. And the thing with other embryos, if you take your embryology, most of your mammal species or other species, when you look at the embryonic development, they all look the same. It is actually very difficult to distinguish which is, an, which is a human embryo from a chicken or a horse or a cat or any other mammal embryo. There are strikingly they are strikingly similar that's the thing with them so aside from morphological and ontogenic homology we also have molecular homology when we talk about molecular homology these are the same similarity in sequences of your dna and that's the thing that we're going to talk about for the next next lectures no the dna sequences and that's actually pretty interesting too because the, it is only about 1 to 2% no? differences. Our sequences are only 1 to 2% different from the chimpanzees, from the chickens. There is only a small fraction of changes in your genetic material. So yeah, there are a lot of similarities and sequences. And only a fraction of those changes constitute us and distinguish humans from your cats, from your chimpanzees, from your chicken, as very small changes in your genetic material. But most of the genetic material are entirely conserved. The majority are the same sequences. <laughs> That's the thing with molecular homology. So aside from your DNA, you can also have similarities in proteins, in similarities in DNA and RNA. So yeah, okay? So those are your homologies and analogies. Yep, that's what I have been mentioning here. The four limb have the same and they evolved into wings. But they are essentially the same four limb for the, all of these species. Meron lang ilang modification to create the specific change that happened okay and we need to take a very cautious approach to this because sometimes we can get tricked or we can fall to the trap of convergent evolution no? because sometimes the similarity in character does not mean the similarity in ancestry or the relatedness Sometimes convergent evolution could get the better of us. Sometimes structures look the same and functions the same, but it doesn't mean that they are the same ancestry. Okay? So some species are similarly looking, but are not related, no? Definitely not related or far from each other. So that's for the case of your... That's the case of your... Convergent evolution, for example, the look at this, no? The similarity between a fish, your shark, your land leptile, reptile that developed into your ichthyosaurs, and your land ma mammals, no? That developed to your porpoise. They have different ancestry, but since they are living the same water condition, they develop the same pectoral and pelvic fins, the same dorsal fins. So they are similarly looking. No? They all have that similarities in them, but they came from different ancestry no? that are not entirely the same from each other. Okay ba? So that's convergent evolution for you. This is also true for the case of your placental mammals and your marsupial mammals. 
if you look at marsupial mammals of Australia and your placental mammals in North America, they came from different, I mean, different parts of the world, no? But they all look the same. Your sugar glider and your flying squirrel. Sugar gliders are, is a marsupial mammal in Australia, while your flying squirrel is a placental mammal, a uterian mammal in your North America, in North America. But when you compare these two, they all look the same. They look like a flying squirrel, but they came from different origins, our ancestries. The one is a marsupial, the, ne the, the other one is a placental, uterian mammal. They have different ancestry, but since they are exposed to the same sim similar con environmental conditions or challenges, they, due to this pressure, similarity in environmental pressure, they evolve similar characteristics, okay? So that's the thing with convergent evolution, okay? And that's different from your homologous characters because homologous characters needs ancestry while analogous characters needs just the same similarity in form and function, okay? In function. So we have something like this. It has come to my attention that not all of us <laughs> are we appear to be. One of us is a plant. <laughs> and yeah. Anyway, I'm going to that. <laughs> so, how do we know what really happened back then? Well, there are a lot of strategies to know what happened. The first one is what we call stat stratigraphy or stratigraphic techniques wherein you well essentially you excavate no and since we all know that the deeper you go the older the rock column or the strata will be so you can distinguish this is older rock rock strata than this and if you find fossils in here and fossils in here that those fossils are definitely younger than the fossils here. Simply put, that is stratigraphy. But there are a lot of challenges to this too. No? But essentially, you need to excavate and excavate, and you find your rock columns and fossils in the layers of strata, in the deposits of your sediments. But these columns are hard to come by nowadays, no? especially when your continents have been moving apart from each other and have been being recycled in and out, no? subducting and being created again. A lot of your, that's why it's hard to study older, older, older years because, it's a, well, those stratigraphic columns or, yeah, your, those stratas, the older they are, the harder they are to come by across because of the dynamics of our world, no? of the earth. Some of it are being recycled back again in the mantle. And yeah, that's the hard thing about stratigraphy. Aside from stratigraphy, we also have what we call radiometric carb dating. No? Radiometric dating. No? In which essentially we take note of the differences and the steady rate of how radioactive materials decay. No? That's the thing about radiometric dating. We rely on the steady rate of how radioactive materials, radioactive materials decay over time. No? There is a certain half-life kasi of these radioactive materials. So like, for example, your carbon and argon, your, po carbon, your potassium and argon, your uranium, your your carbon no so the thing about carbon dating and the rest of this dating no? the thing about this is that we rely on this certain degree of steadiness in the half-life of your radioactive isotopes and this is how we knew this is how scientists have figured out how old was the earth by measuring the half-life of your of your uranium no that's why we are only some 4.5 billion years old. I mean, the Earth, due to the presence of and the half-life of the uranium in your older rocks in the Earth. No, 
But for certain organisms, we don't use uranium. We only use um, carbon-14. And it has a half-life of 5,730 years. And the thing with carbon-14 is it's actually a much simpler way of defining or measuring no? the age of the organism. What will scientists do is that they will, well, after excavating the bones, they will measure the amount of carbon-14 they contain. So the amount of C-14, this radioactive isotope that remain in the skeleton, even after death, will be measured. And then since it is decaying at a steady rate over time, if you can measure the amount of it, and compare it to the standards that are there, you can extrapolate or estimate the, the time when the bones was alive or the organism was alive. Or you can figure out roughly when the person died, for example. But the thing about the radiocarbon dating, it's actually what we didn't realize was we don't take into account no, how carbon that were the carbon-14 that we're dating gets into the body of the organism that we are measuring. And it gets into their body by the food they eat. And it turns out that the people with a diet high in fish, say for example your Vikings, no, since they are in a landlocked island up in the north, and there are no much not much trees there, they have to rely on eating fish. It turns out that those people with a high diet on fish absorbs older carbon than meat eaters no? like us or plant eaters like us because the ocean contains older carbons that are hundreds of years old so viking bones appear older actually so we have to if your your organism of study eats a lot eats a lot of fish so if the bones of the organism that you study eats a lot of fish it will skew your data kaya nagtataka yung mga scientists nun why is that these Viking bones appear older in carbon dating measurements? No? So, ganun pala yun. Kag puro ista yung kinakain mo, magiging older yung buto mo. Because there are a lot of older carbon in your ocean. Aside from stratigraphy in radiocarbon dating, we also have dendrochronology. So, these are essentially measuring of the growth rings or the oxygen-18 isotopes in your in your Trees, no? Since when there is a high occurrence of hurricanes, your growth rings contains less O18 isotopes. So things like that. <clears throat> That's your dendrochronology. You need to cut open your trees and look for certain growth rings. Now for the last part of how scientists know what happened when, is scientists nowadays are looking for what we call molecular clocks because certain stretches of our DNA or certain genes in our genome mutate at a steady rate. So meaning when through time that specific gene sequence will accumulate certain mutation or changes and since these gene sequences mutate at a steady rate we can calculate how old or how new the species was. Diba? For example, your protein alpha globin, a component in your homoglobin, has a mutation rate of 56 base pair per billion of years, depending on the amount of genetic changes in his alpha globin molecule. That's also true for your mitochondrial DNA, the DNA that your mom passed to you. Looking out for those genetic markers, no? the buildup of mutation for a certain stretch of your DNA, we can extrapolate or calculate how old, when, and when that organism was present. And that's a much more reliable source of time because DNA is somehow conservative and has a certain rate of mutation only that it permits. So, okay. These, we have different assigned readings for monopiety. Parapiley and polypiley. So I hope you take your time in reading them before you move on to the next lecture. So pay attention to this piley piley, okay? You need to distinguish what they mean. And as, as I was mentioning before, we love monopiley but we hate polypiley. Yeah, 
it's quite an exciting time to be alive. Uh, it's a good time indeed. I'm really looking forward for our species and our technology. So that's it for today. If you have questions, comments, and suggestions, leave it down in the comment section below. If you like the video, please do leave a thumbs up. It will really help me. And yep. Thanks for watching. Peace out.